when you were a kid, staying with childhood, did you did you think at all about that like uh next door was was Russia who was like a threatening country? Uh did that ever like when you were young, young, like elementary school, did you ever process that? Well, when I was in elementary school, I never had, like, understand the concept of, like, war itself to that extent. Yeah. Like, you, like, read the books and you understand it was, like, old times ago, like, in the 18th and 16th centuries. And you don't really understand that it could happen now or it actually is happening right now yeah. when you were a kid. And talking about, like, Russia, the Ukrainian situation when I was a kid's kid, like, I was going, for example, to Egypt or Turkey and... Like, for example, my family was, like, introducing me to some people who they met there. Yeah. And they were, like, Russians, for example. It was, like, back before 2014. And you never really understand that, like, people can make a threat to you when you, like, speak to, like, another 10-year-old. You're right. like, cool. Right. Sort of. You don't really understand that. But after some while, when it became, like, bigger on the global scale mm -hmm. it's actually very upsetting that when it just started not even like all ukrainians really paid that much of attention to it like not all of them knew it like basically mm -hmm. like kids talking ways like parents did of course mm -hmm. but they didn't put it on the same scale as it put, is put now so like one upsetting fact is that like people think that like war started in ukraine in 2022 which is fair but not really because it started in 2014 right. with, like Crimea and actually so like people don't understand that it's like long term process that just not happened one day right but when I was a kid I didn't fully understand it because like parents protect you from it yeah. like they don't really start talking to you like oh this happens mm. because like it's far away sort of because Kiev is like central Ukraine sort of even, right like ish let's say and it was in eastern Ukraine, in like Donetsk region, for example. And when you're a kid, you don't fully understand it. Because, for example, I've never been in Donetsk. So if someone would tell me like about that, I would be like, okay, where exactly is it? Because mm. when you're six, you don't really like concern about it to that extent. Yeah. Was was there a mo Like you mentioned the, the annexation of Crimea. Yeah. Uh, was there a point where you're like, not like an oh crap moment, but like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like it kind of hits you as like, it's possible that this could happen to us. I think it was when I was just asking my parents why we cannot go to like a particular part of the city. Mm -hmm. Because at that time they started like a lot of revolutions in Ukraine, basically in major cities in Kiev as well. And people were protesting towards like government. They don't do anything about it. Yeah. And... That point, you really start understanding when it happens in like in your city. Yeah. Like when you understand something is wrong, and I just was trying to ask my parents, but it's it's very weird feeling because like if someone has kids, they know that kids ask like million of questions every day, and yeah. sometimes this questioner is like, "Oh, is this person dad or stuff like that?" Like right. you don't really know how to answer <laughs> to this question, right? Yeah. So like I was asking this kind of questions, and my parents was trying to like explain it to me, but not in a way of like harming my like a seven year old brain. Yeah. So this is the moment I understand that there's something happening, but like not to the like oh crap moment. It's yeah. more of like okay, it's not great. Yeah. So. When you grew up, it's slowly just starting, like, being more noticeable. For example, in my school, there were a lot of kids from Donetsk who moved to my classroom. Yeah. And then, like, they start telling you some stories. They start, like, sharing that. But at the same time, you would never say any difference. Because this kid doesn't look like a traumatized kid who, like, spend their time in the shelters when they were, like, 10. They're, mm. like, absolutely normal kids. So sometimes it's controversial. Mm. What about, uh, did you have any stories or kind of um things that either relatives or friends or ancestors told you about things that had happened like ways that kind of major events had affected their lives like the holodomor or the um world war ii or you know the, the uh, maiden revolution like was there any stories that you have where like just either pre uh collapsed the Soviet Union kind mm -hmm. of stories that I think what 
uh, I think as every family in Ukraine will have their stories. Like, my family was not like harmed to that extent as a lot of people okay. did. But like, I think during the Holodomor, it like a lot of people did, even my family. And like, I think that's why we have a tradition in Eastern Europe that you are not allowed to eat like food on the plate. So like, you need to finish what you eat. Really? Yeah, because like, during the Holodomor, a lot of like. 99% of the population didn't have anything to eat besides like potato right. that you ate like during the months and months and that's it. Yeah. So that's why when you come to like my grandparents as well, like they're trying to feed you. This is the concept of Eastern European. Like we are trying to feed you as a concept of like we're trying to care for you because my grandparents didn't have enough food for a long while during the Holodomor. And that's the way they show they care. And mm. this is something like that I understand when I grew up as well. Because yeah. you don't understand it when you're a kid. Did you did you learn about like those events in school? Like were those taught like to you? Yeah. Well, one of my favorite subjects in school was history. Okay. So Me too. during yeah really yeah okay so during history classes you start to understand more and talking to your family. But originally, like I would say that fully you understand everything that happened even during the time you were born already when you like grew up and yeah. you can fully like. Be responsible how you react on it because yeah. like everyone trying to support you and like protect you because when you're 10 you cannot really like influence on it fully. yeah so this is it and a lot of people when i was in ukraine in september i visited ukraine for four days like i would say people are just tired but at the same time they are not like losing hope or losing their optimistic mindset or losing their like stories that they had mm. which was very interesting for me because sometimes when you look on the news and people think like everything's so horrible like etc it is but at the same time you see how people are trying to like go through it and pretend that everything is okay so you can like go to work have electricity have water etc because there's a lot of like for example like electricity shortcuts that you don't have like water or electricity for like entire day or mm. for two days mm -hmm. so it's inter it was interesting for me how like people are adapting to yeah. new circumstances even though it's like crap <laughs> originally speaking yeah mm. what about um the annexation of crimea mm -hmm. and the, the Maidan revolution and the war in dunbass well, in this case, I would just give an example of Maidan that was happening in Kiev, where basically unarmed citizens in central Kiev, just in central Kiev, near like monuments, they, where is like Verkhovna Rada, which is like a uh, parliament mm -hmm. in UK, for example. So they were like basically unarmed going to the parliament and like voting and protesting, sleeping on the streets for months in order to get the justice from the government, yeah. in order to like switch the government. And mm -hmm. there was basically like a small war in central Kiev between Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian government at the same time where like alarmed weapons like <clears throat> army sorts of army were <clears throat> trying to like prevent citizens from coming to the like parliament. And there a lot of people were shot. Mm -hmm. Like even though it's like central Kiev, just central Kiev. Do you have any stories, uh, oh, personal yeah. stories from that that people have told you or if so, you were affected in any way? I have a story of my assistant. She works with me on the marketing company and I prepared, like, I asked her to write her story for me so I can read it to you. And I'm going to try to find it right now so we can, like, basically get to know more from her story than from mine because she's originally from, like, Donetsk. And she was the one who like experienced basically two wars in Donetsk when she right. was forced to move to Kiev, and then now. So for people that don't know, right, there was, um, the Russia annexed Crimea. Yeah. And then following that was a war, in the Donbass region, yeah. which is the the easternmost part of Ukraine. Very great at history. Yeah, I should probably clarify that. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. So. My PA is named Lila, and she writes her story. I'm just going to write read it to you so I don't like miss important parts of it. So she said, the first shocking event, as I remember now, was when Crimea was annexed. I remember how my whole family was sitting in my grandmother's kitchen, 
when the news broke, I was still a child and I didn't quite understand what could it mean. But from my mother's experience, I realized that I would somehow affect our lives. We used to go to Crimea every summer and losing it was very painful for me. At the same time, we all watched with fear the events on Maidan, learning every day about the situation of relatives in Kiev. And a few months later, the war began. At that time, everyone thought it would end in a few weeks. However, it stopped going to school because my parents didn't want me to study in the basement and we moved in with my grandmother to a safer area. And after an explosion awoke us at night, we decided to go to the seaside for a couple of weeks just to get through this event. But after the end of whole weeks, it became clear that the conflict wouldn't resolve so quickly and we went to Kyiv to stay with relatives for a short while. Uh, relatives sent us to our things, sent us our things by post, and we started the new life from scratch in the capital, Kiev, hoping to return home for a few more years, and then losing even that hope. So going to seaside, I found myself in another city without the possibility of returning home and seeing a part of myself and my family once anymore. So basically, what this story is saying that. It started from Crimea when we all used to go to like summer holidays. Yeah. And then to the Donetsk region where it like became sort of the same as it began in 2022 for all of us. But it began in like Donetsk in 2014. And basically she experienced the same situation we all experienced in 2022 but earlier on. And I think like it's important to understand that this trauma never really goes away. Yeah. So in short, when I was invited to the podcast, I wanted to combine it with the fundraising, and I chose the company that my friends own. It is basically in Ukraine, but operates worldwide. It's called Tvori Dobro, which basically translates into like make good deeds. And this is a charity organization that is helping women and kids who suffered from the war in 2022, 2023, 24, and right now, and the future. And they are making the fundraising for the needs of those who suffered from the war from uh, Eastern region, primarily for like kids and women, mainly for psychological support for those kids who are left without their parents because of the war, and they're making just like supplies of uh, medicine, psychological help, clothing, toys, etc. So basically, first need that you need. And we're going to probably leave the link down below so you can have a look on their website or Instagram or social medias to like see their data yourself so you can be sure that there is like internationally recognized organization. Uh, also, as sort of like giveaway we wanted to do in order to like stimulate people to donate uh basically kids those kids i was just mentioned before they made like a small workshop where they like done some paintings and one of the paintings and done together and there is a painting with like ukrainian symbolics on it and the name of the organization with like ukrainian flags and everything uh like this kind of a size of the painting so quite big uh that uh, was taken from all the way on the car from Ukraine, Kiev to here. Wow. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be like giving it away for a random donation. So from all of the donations that were made, starting from today to like, let's say a month's time, uh, we'll just choose a donation that's going to, uh, like based on the number system, we're just going to choose a donation randomly and send the painting wherever, whenever you want. Mm. Uh, for you as uh, bonus can i can i just ask one is that because i have listeners that are kind of in all over the world all over the world so is that just for people that are in edinburgh no we can't we can uh, if this painting got from ukraine i'm sure we can deliver it to you anywhere <laughs> to the to <laughs> new york city of course um and and so this is this is just to clarify this is an organization that's helping women and children in Ukraine right now. Yeah. That seems like a noble cause. 